I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. I'd like to thank um, everyone for inviting me to come here and to have these conversations. Um, I believe that in the process of democracy, I believe every voice needs to be heard. So I appreciate all of you coming out to ask these questions and to participate in democracy. As you know, my name is Kelly Dick. I am the NDP candidate for Kishner Conestoga, and I'm very proud to represent Andrea Horvath and the NDP in this election. This is a change election in this province where we will be able to make some drastic changes, changes for the better uh, in people's lives around the province. So a little bit about me. Uh, I, I was born and raised in this riding um, until they changed all the boundaries and, and the, the place that I live in is now in another uh, riding, but I, I am from the region. Um, I have worked in this region my entire life, about 34 years for Loblaws companies. Uh, I'm a department manager with theirs and I've been there you know, the better portion of my life. Uh, I'm also a union steward with United Food and Commercial Workers. I sit on the executive with them as well, Local 175. And I'm recording secretary for the Labour Council, Water the Region Labour Council. Uh, I work directly with the community, uh, with a lot of community groups, uh, through my work with United Way. I started an event here in town called Tampon Tuesday, uh, where we gather tampons and pads uh, together at a venue in town, and I collect them all, count them up, and they get donated to the food bank. Uh, this represents uh, the need that we have in the community for these products and these items for women and young girls who can't afford them in our communities. My reason for getting involved in politics is um, pretty simple, actually. Um, I wanted to help make the lives of people in our community uh, better. Um, in the work that I've done community-wise, I've been it's afforded me the opportunity to see how people live um, in different situations. And I believe during this election and the things that we can do here, I believe that we can make life better for people in Ontario. We're heading into the one, one of the most important elections this province has ever seen. Uh, and Ontario is asking for a change. What that change looks like depends on you. Every single vote counts in this election. Regardless of what you think, every single person who goes out and puts an X on a ballot is opting to make that change for this province. We've seen cuts to funding and freezes in our healthcare system, privatization of healthcare services, the sell-off of Hydro One, which has increased our hydro bills up to 300% in the last four years, laying off of nurses and frontline workers, which is a direct, has a direct impact on our healthcare system, deteriorating schools and hospitals, staggering student debt, unaffordable, unaffordable childcare, and the list goes on. It is our responsibility in this election to elect a government who is willing to deal with these issues and make the change that this province deserves. On June the 7th, on June the 7th, <laughs> I hope I can count on your support. That one kind of messed me up. <laughs> That's the spreaded second bell. <laughs> so thank you, Kelly. You get four seconds less in answering the next question. <laughs> I have two timekeepers here. They're keeping track. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Uh, Dan. Would you favor us with your opening statement? Uh, listen closely, please, to what my fellow candidates will be saying this evening. Uh, every promise they make will boil down to something like, I'll give you something for free, and I'll make somebody else pay for it. I'm going to make it so that you can afford a lakefront condo in Toronto, or you can get free higher education, or OHIP will cover your dental and birth control, and somebody else is going to pay for it. Or you might hear them say that they've figured out some way to make it so that nobody has to pay for it. If only the regulators would involve themselves aggressively in the operations of home builders, then the housing would become cheap and plentiful, and nobody would have to pay for it. Or perhaps they'll lower your income tax and your gas tax, but they'll continue the same reckless spending policies that have been in place by their predecessors. And there you have it, free money. I hope nobody's going to fall for that. But the important question is, who is somebody else? Maybe it's the family farmer who works his fingers to the bone to keep the land that's been in his family for generations. Well, that land technically would be worth a lot of money if he sold it, therefore he's rich. So let's tax him. Let's tax him until he has to end his family's tradition forever and sell that to a factory farm. Or the retiree who has worked hard for decades and now has enough investments to keep comfortable. Well, if he makes his money entirely from investments, he must be one of those rich people. So let's tax him until he's forced to get a part-time job. Or blue-collar workers who are forced on social assistance because their employer after employer packs up and leaves the province thanks to aggressive corporate taxes or burdensome over-regulation. Or when you have one breadwinner in your family, 
Well, other, the other spouse stays at home to watch the kids. And even though you're fighting to earn a paycheck that will feed your entire household, well, the numbers on those paychecks are still technically pretty high, so that means you're rich. And you need to be taxed until your spouse is forced to find a job and your child ends up at daycare. Time and time again, somebody else turns out to be you. It's about time we stop falling for the same old tricks. It's about time the government of Ontario truly lowers taxes by responsibly reducing budgets and shutting off all the extravagant handouts for both corporations and individuals. It's time that the citizens of Ontario start getting to keep what we earn and choose how we spend it. My name is Daniel Benoit, and I'm the Kitchener Conestoga candidate for the Libertarian Party. Thank you very much, Dan. I'd like to call on Bob Johnson now from the Green Party for his opening statement. Bob? Hi. I'm Bob Johnson from the Kitchener Green Party. I live in Elmira, and I'm very pleased to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. How many of you are repeat customers? How many of you were at the uh, All Candidates meeting last night? Uh, a fair number. Good to see you being very um, engaged in the political system. This is a very democracy is a huge step for, uh, for the Green Party. I first got involved with uh, politics around 2007, the provincial election, when they had the referendum on electoral reform, on changing the voting system. And I believe very strongly in that, and so I, I stood uh, at rallies and waved signs and uh, shouted that uh, you we know, want change, and unfortunately that was voted down. I remained politically active ever since, to the point where I've become dissatisfied with all manner of so it's not just electoral reform. And so in 2015, I ran for the federal candidacy for Kitchen and Conestoga. And here I am again in uh, 2018 running for the provincial uh, MPP seat. In addition to, to electoral reform, which was uh, my introduction into politics, um, I've become involved in, uh, in other community social justice issues, uh, specifically with a group called PWPs, which publishes out a calendar of all the social justice events that take place in the other region. And water region non-violence, which advocates a non-violent uh, approach to life in general. It has a wonderful festival in the Victoria Park Island in the middle of the summer sometime. This is sort of a, a core value for me. It's a core value for uh, the Green Party, that everything that the, the Green Party is, is going to propose in its uh, platform, in its, uh, in its budget, is all based on, on those principles of, of social justice, of non-violence, participatory democracy, and yes, as well, um, a sustainable uh, environment and uh, looking out for uh, you know, tree hunters and bunny lovers. But that's not the mainstay for the Green Party. The Green Party does actually provide, uh, provide us with a very comprehensive uh, budget and, and platform. Um, and yes, there are only people who have to pay for that. And I will tell you right now, some of those people are you. So, regardless of that, um, I do hope that uh, we have some very good questions on, uh, on all aspects of policy, uh, budgeting as, as well as social justice issues, and hopefully we can answer those questions for you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob. From the Liberal Party, Joe Gowing. Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Gowing. I am your Liberal candidate for Kitchener Conestoga. I have, uh, was born and raised in Waterloo Region. I have lived in our riding for the last eight years. I live in Forest Heights with my fiance, who's here with me tonight, her two daughters, and I have a young son. Uh, I've been involved in politics since I was a teenager, and uh, I have been involved in campaigns. I ran in 2006 as a trustee for the Waterloo County District School Board, and I was elected and served four years uh, on that board. Um, so I have the experience in the education. I was actually only 23 at the time when I, when I did that. Uh, my current role is a financial advisor with, uh, or sorry, a mortgage specialist, my previous role is financial advisor. I'm currently a mortgage specialist with Meridian Credit Union, and I know that with my finance background, I can bring the experience of paying for the social services that we desperately need, but also being financially responsible. Our party does have a platform. It is a clear platform. Um, we have a, a, a balanced, to, excuse me, a plan to get back into the black, and that is what I'm gonna hold my party to. I've been involved in the community through different services. Uh, I'm a Rotarian. So I have been active uh, through that corporation as well, 
and I'm also a member of the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 126, where I sit on their board as the uh, Public Relations Officer. Uh, with those two, I, I know what our seniors, I know what our youth, and I know what everyday people are looking for. I know why we have our fundraisers, I know why we're volunteering, and volunteering is very important. And, and if you ask my fiance, most nights uh, during the week I'm out and uh, I don't see her, I'm surprised she said yes to me. Uh, <laughs> but realistically, I, I'm out in the community on a daily basis, listening, helping, doing what I can. And that's what I'm going to bring to this role as a PP. Thanks very much, Joe. And our final opening statement comes from the progressive conservative candidate, Mike Harris. Mike. So, uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, I'm Mike Harris. I'm the PC candidate for Kitchener Conestoga. And uh, first, uh, thank you to the New Hamburg Board of Trade for hosting us here tonight. And uh, of course, the folks from Honeycomb House for their, their generosity here as well. And uh, to the other candidates sitting at the table, I know it's been a, it's been a long day for all of us. And, uh, and we look forward to, uh, to your questions tonight from the audience as well. Um, I'd like to begin by telling you a bit about myself and where we stand as a party. Politics and public service has been an integral part of my life for as long as I can remember. I grew up in North Bay, and as the oldest son of a former Ontario Premier, I learned at an early age the importance of participating in the democratic process and listening to your community. Professionally, I'm an entrepreneur and relationship builder. Moved to Waterloo Region to open a business five years ago, and currently work as the Director of Enterprise Business Development for Road One, uh, which is a high-tech company specializing in digital security. Since the campaign launched, I've been to thousands of doors, and I've listened to many people who have a story about how they are suffering. They're having trouble paying for assistance like I grew They're having trouble finding and arranging for childcare. And they feel the current government has made life more difficult for them and their families. One of the reasons I put my name forward to run for office was because of my family. As a father of five children under the age of 11, I am deeply concerned about the burden being placed on them. According to the National Post, Ontario has easily just undergone the most aggressive and prolonged period of debt accumulation in its history. To put this into perspective for everyone, uh, we're sitting at roughly around $312 billion of debt, which equates to about $220,000 for every man and child in the province. The NDP have promised to add another $19.4 billion to the debt and run consecutive deficits until at least 2023, and the Liberals have planned to spend even more. As parents, we all want to see our kids have every opportunity to succeed. And we need change here in Ontario, and we need it now. We cannot wait. I welcome the opportunity to listen to your questions and tell you more about an Ontario PC government and how we will build prosperity for Waterloo Region by putting more money back in your pocket, creating a better environment for business, reducing the burden being placed on our families, all while protecting and improving frontline services that are so important to us all. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, so those are the opening statements, and so now comes the question period. Okay, so I have the first one. Um, uh, this came, uh, was one of two questions that came through the website to the New Hamburg Board of Trade, um, and it reads as follows. Uh, we've established the Downtown Committee to work on enhancing our downtowns and strengthening collaborative efforts between business and our local governments. What could you see yourself doing as our local representative if you were elected to help us in such matters? Uh, Bob, could you start the panel's discussion on that question, please? A very interesting question. I think probably if, if local business and, and local communities are already working together, the best thing the provincial government could do is probably stay out of the way. There are going to be incentives available for, uh, for municipal uh, infrastructure development, which may help uh, the local community uh, engage more in the downtown area, uh, some improvements perhaps in the downtown. But I think that for the most part, when uh, the community and, and the downtown businesses are already experiencing a good relationship together, and since it looks that way in New Hamburg, and in fact, there are many of the municipalities in the region, I think the uh, provincial government, by Staying out of the way is probably uh, the, the best solution for letting that friendship, that, that collaboration grow naturally. 
I think that, you know, from what I've seen here uh, over my, uh, my time canvassing in New Hamburg and, and spend a little bit of time down here on Main Street and, and talking to some of the business owners here, um, whether that be the, the, the folks over at Charleston Insurance or the folks at PWP, um, it, it seems like things are on the right track. Um, and, you know, Bob does make a good point. You know, if, 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 the, if the province, um, sorry, if, if the... Uh, if the, or if the community is already liaising well with um, with the, the PIA or, or the association here, it probably is best to stay out of it. But I think one thing is making sure, you know, as, as governments and local MPPs, is that we make sure that, that these community associations are taking full advantage of the programs that are available that you could provincially, whether that be for funding or, uh, you know, just general assistance in, in planning and going forward. Thanks, Mike. If you could keep passing the baton the other way, over to Joe. Does Joe will be the next well, guy yeah. operating in on that question? Downtown beautification, Joe. Perfect. Um, so I, I'm originally from Cambridge, and Cambridge actually did uh, go through this process of uh, renovating their downtowns. And where the provincial government I could see coming in is exactly what I've been doing going out and talking to and staying connected with the local uh, municipalities and, and the councillors and the mayors um, to find out and make sure that we understand what the needs are of the city itself and the BIA. So if, as, as Bob said, that there is no issues, but we still need to be connected with them. You need to be connected with your community. You need to know what is happening in your community. And that's what I would do is be the liaison between the communities and and the province itself. So if, if something does arise, I know what the issue is and I can help out. Thanks very much, Joe. I'll next call upon Kelly to respond to that question. Kelly, please. Um, it's very important uh, to understand that this riding is 1,100 square kilometers. Uh, a big portion of that is uh, rural riding in small communities. So. Each community represents a little bit of a, a different uh, outlook on small business, um, economy, um, things like that, jobs. So I think to work with the municipalities, to work with um, the mayors and the city councilors and, and things like that, um, I think each individual one, um, and I agree, it needs to be given its space according to what the community believes that they want. Because what we think is best for us in perhaps in, in the Kitchener portion of our riding, may not be uh, the best idea for the smaller communities. So again, I, I'm going to agree with Joe that we do need to work collaboratively with the municipalities to make sure that we're not infringing um, you know, large city uh, ideas on smaller communities. Although the smaller communities are growing uh, with you know, people moving in from the GTA, uh, you know, it is uh, urban development and things like that. Uh, it's very important, again, to understand what the needs of each community are. That bell is clogged. <laughs> uh, so again, I, I, I think that each municipality uh, is, is separate in itself and uh, needs to be treated as such. So four seconds again. Okay, right now. <laughs> uh, it's your turn, buddy. Uh, Fire away. I'm going to agree with everyone else uh, that it, it's uh, typically the problem should stay out of the municipal issues, but I'm going to draw a uh, moral line that uh, it, it is very much the job of the province to stay out of uh, municipal issues. Very often in the kitchen of Conestoga, we're forced to pay through our provincial taxes for construction projects in Toronto. Um, when you know, we're, we're mostly a rural area here, so why, why should we be paying for big construction projects someplace far away? But the Libertarian Party is hard line against in, um, giving municipal subsidies of any kind um, as to big areas, small areas. We want to leave it up to the municipalities to take care of their own budget and to uh, beautify their downtown areas. That's pretty much it. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Dan. A question from the floor, ma'am. Thank you very much. Turn on that mic. And while she's uh, doing that, uh, again, if anyone wants to ask a question but doesn't want to use the mic, just put up your hand and Lyle will get you a pen and paper to uh, write it out and then run it up to me. The floor is yours now. Thank you. Wow. 
Nobody can wait in line, so goodness knows. My background is public and private health care. When interviewing individuals, I have always used the behavioral method of interviewing. Please, each candidate answer the following. And if you stray from the answer, that means you have 15 seconds left. Now. That's fine. If you stray from the answer, I will stop you. I have done leadership and team skills in the past. Sorry, I have shown leadership and team skills in the past. Give us an example of how you have shown these skills. Okay. Uh, if you put the microphone back. But I may have to stop something. No, uh, after you ask your question, it's up to the candidates to talk right now. So folks, what uh, the question from the floor really is to ask you folks individually and personally uh, examples of, uh, one or two examples of your leadership skills that you've uh, exhibited in your life. And Joe, would you like to start the panel off on that? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, Leadership actually happened when I was, a, a, for me, when I was in air cadets as a teenager. So I learned leadership uh, from a young age. Uh, most recently, my leadership skills would be in the form of when I was managing at, uh, at a branch at the TD Canada Trust. Um, we worked collaboratively to find and work with the rules that are coming in from uh, FISCO and, and whatnot, uh, the regulators from the banks, to find out what fits with our customers, find out how we can work and build our, not just our business, but also the customer service side as well. Um, the last branch that I had taken over was uh, dead last in customer service. So we sat down in this, as a team to figure out what are we doing that is causing our customers to not see the actual service that we're providing. Um, with, uh, with a, a few months uh, working on our brainstorming ideas, uh, meetings, monthly meetings that we've had, uh, going up to other branches to see what they're doing and bring that back to our branch. Um, and that's one, we went from dead last that year to number one in the district. So it's working together collaboratively, seeing what others are doing right and implementing it in our own branch. Dan, could you pick up the conversation on this point? <laughs> Using that one mic that we have for five people out there, Dan. Example of leadership skill, Dan. Take it away. Uh, well, I've lived in this area for um, well, since I was 11. And uh, I've worked a lot with uh, the IT companies in Waterloo. And the internet is an extremely delicate and fickle, um, complicated machine. And even a moment's downtime can cost millions. And uh, it, it was quite a challenge to get to the point where I could be trusted as an engineer not just to work on projects, but to lead them as well. So, I suppose I can't get into too many specific examples, like say NPAs and such, but um, yeah, it's, that's pretty much my position right there. Lots of IT work, lots of uh, leading teams uh, producing um, the projects. Uh, I have to engineer them from scratch. So. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. You're not really allowed to call yourself an engineer if you haven't uh, gone through college as an engineer. It's just one of those strange little regulations that is affecting all of our lives. Uh, so here I am, strange question. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the things we could get rid of. Uh, we would try to minimize the impact of the government in our lives. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, could you pass the mic over to Bob? Just wander. There we go. Thank you. So, as others have mentioned, I've, I've had a professional career where I've uh, been in, in management, I've been a staff supervisor. But I think that being a, a leader in the communities is probably more important for the, uh, the, the skill that I would need as uh, your MGP. So, I've, I've, I've mentioned that I've been involved with uh, KWP since uh, we are on I also happen to be the co chair for uh, Fair Rose Waterloo, uh, the proportional representation of grassroots group. 
And I've set up uh, a number of uh, technical organizations, such as um, the KW Nonprofit uh, Systems Administrators, for uh, uh, a support group for technical people who provide uh, services to nonprofit agencies. Uh, nonprofit agencies have constraints on generally budgetary constraints and staffing constraints. And so bringing these folks together so they've got some larger network to, uh, to work with their peers. Um, also, KW VoIP has actually become a very useful point as a technology of uh, using telephones over the internet. Um, I happen to be able to use those skills to set up our uh, campaign office that we brought in region rooms. So these are our practical skills that I've actually put into practice but largely to serve the community as, as well as benefit uh, from this profession. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, Mike, could you pick up the panel's discussion on that point of leadership? Yes. <laughs> Turn on the mic first, Mike. I think we're good. All right. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for the question. And of course, uh, leaders, leadership and, and team skills are, are very important in this line of work. Um, as, uh, as, as a father, um, you know, it's, it's something that, that, that we do every day in our house is you know, leadership of our family and, and making sure that our five kids are following the rules and, 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 and being as good as they can be. Um, and of course, uh, you know, in my professional life, uh, I've been in leadership roles most of my adult life, whether that be uh, running other people's businesses, running my own business, um, and of course in the position I am now. Um, I think one of the, the main things that sets good leaders apart is being able to take uh, information from other people that may have a good idea uh, it, it may not necessarily be something you agree with, and we did talk about this earlier um, when we were in, uh, um, sorry, when we were in Elmira at the, uh, the chamber debate. Um, but but the sign of a good leader is is taking something that you may not necessarily always agree with and bringing it into the fold and molding it into um, you know something that that you want to move forward with. Thanks, Mike and Kelly. Could you continue the panel's discussion on leadership? Thanks for the question. Uh, I have been a department manager with Lala's companies for about 26 years. Um, so as far as um, leadership goes, it's, it's, it involves a lot of training, uh, it involves a lot of empathy, it involves um, a lot of things when you're dealing with different types of people, uh, not only within the department, but within the, the store as well. Um, as a department manager, you're responsible for many different things, not only in your own department, but you know, kind of all over the place. So, uh, I've trained a lot of people to do the job that I do. Uh, my belief is, as a, as a manager, and as a trainer, and as a leader, uh, that you are only as strong as your weakest link. So, if you have a company, or um, a family, or a group of friends, or you know, a, a community group, um, you want to make sure that everybody in the group has an equal opportunity uh, to become leaders in, in, the, in the community. Um, furthering leadership, uh, I also am the reporting secretary for the Waterloo Regional Labor Council, and I'm the chair of the Women's Committee as well, so um, I build a team there. I've got uh, quite a few women that are on that, uh, on that committee as well. Um, and as far as um, um, Team skills. Uh, I run an event called Tampon Tuesday, uh, where people in the community get together and bring me feminine hygiene products at uh, a bar, and we deliver them to uh, the food bank in the region. That's great, you know, thanks. All right. Uh, next question from the floor, sir. Fire away. Oh, here you go. Hi, my, <clears throat> Hi, my name is Aaron. Uh, I too have uh, small children. Um, and recently, my family had to spend $63,000 to renovate our house to move my mother and father in law. For multiple reasons, one of the primary of which was actually childcare. Now, during this campaign, there's been a, some discussion regarding um, childcare, and many of the platforms being proposed would benefit me in no way, shape, or form. Um, how would your party and your platform benefit individuals like myself and take childcare upon themselves? Uh, and uh, how, how would it help me in my family? Great. Great question. Thanks very much. What could be more important than the health of our children? 
and child care. Mike, do you want to lead the panel's discussion on that question, please? Let's make sure we're on. Okay. Um, Aaron, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, I think what you'll find with, with our child care uh, package or reform, uh, it would work very well for you. Um, we're looking uh, to be able to refund up to 75% uh, of your total cost of child care, uh, which would equate to uh, roughly a uh, $6,750 per child. But I think the best thing um, for you is, is the flexibility of what we're offering. So you're not tied into a licensed daycare. You're not tied into um, you know, a certain age range, uh, whether it be you know, two to four, two to five years old. Uh, our plan would encompass the ages of zero to 15. Uh, and you would be allowed to use those tax credits for licensed childcare if, if you chose that road. Uh, but you'd also be able to use it for day camps. Uh, you'd also be used, able to use it for uh, a babysitter. Or in the case of, it seems like your grandparents are, are their grandparents moving and your parents, um, you would be able to apply those tax credits directly to that as well. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Joe, do you want to pick up the panel's discussion on child care? Absolutely. So the local government has uh, put their, our platform out and we're going to be covering child care for ages two and a half to four years old. That is a crucial stage in uh, the development of our children. And I know that it's for parents that are looking to return back to work. Uh, regardless, if you'll hear male, female, whatever it is, parents that want to go back to work. I actually stayed home with my son when he was born uh, for six months out of that. So um, I know what the, what the issues are, and, and, and thanks for your question on that. But we are going to be saving, that's going to be saving $17,000 a year Per child, the daycare that uh, our party is providing. So, two and a half years to four years old when they start full day kindergarten. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Dan, could you pick up the discussion on child care, please? Hello. Uh, so, the Libertarian Party's policy is to reduce the scope of government as much as possible. And this includes things like uh, handouts for uh, child care. However, the policy is not to take um, any government program away until it's been replaced by something else. So the long-term solution is to make it so that you can afford child care because the taxes will be low. Uh, so if we can, for every dollar that we, that we would take away from a program like that, we would, we would find a way to replace it, and we'd want to be certain that we're replacing it because we're not rushing headlong into a smaller government. Um, now, in the meantime, we may support something similar to the, uh, the PCC today. Um, uh, obviously, we would support 100% your ability to choose where your money goes if that money comes into your hands from the government. This is our policy for healthcare. This is our policy um, for education. Uh, it's our policy for uh, child care. Uh, if you receive the money from the government, you get the choice of where it's spent. We're not going to decide for you. Going to say this particular place, this particular class of places is where you would spend your money. We're going to make sure that you get that option. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Kelly, would you like to continue the discussion on child care? Absolutely. Thanks, Aaron, for the question. Um, the child care issues in this province uh, have become a real issue. Parents um, have had to make the choice between having one child or having multiple children because it's so expensive for childcare. On average in this province, for newborn babies, we spend on average $1,165 a month for childcare. When you have a toddler, it's $935 on average. When you have preschool, it's $835. What we have is parents uh, working to pay for childcare. And when you have parents that are working part-time precarious jobs, one, two, or three of them, um, to pay for childcare, uh, that becomes an issue. Uh, so parents will choose to stay home and they'll choose to only have one child or perhaps two if they can afford it. Our plan is to cover child care until parents no longer need it. So from zero until um, whatever age the parents believe that the child can stay home by themselves. If you earn $40,000 a year or less, your child care is free. If you earn $40,000 and one, and higher, uh, your child care is on a pay-as-you-can with a maximum of $12 a day. 
This will allow parents to then go back to work after having a child, and it will also allow more parents um, to opt in to having more children uh, by making child care more affordable. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Bob, could you conclude the discussion of the panel on child care? Well, it actually sounded to me like you've already solved your child care problem. You've got your, uh, your the child's grandparents living with you now. And you solved the housing problem because you've renovated your house and, and have your, uh, your parents living with you at, at this point. But I think maybe your question was more, you incurred a huge expense in, in making this available. I think maybe you're asking, is this something that, how can the government help you with the expenses you've already incurred? Is that correct? Well, I'm still paying the, the, the loan payments on it, so I'm still technically paying for it. Right. Um, so it, it's, it's more a question of, of you spent this on, on your house, and, and the Green Party does actually um, plan to have uh, a, a program for house, housing home refitting for better energy consumption, uh, or less energy consumption, if you will. So being creative about your child care issue could have probably have been solved with using the retrofit uh, funding that's available to refit your house. I'm, I'm almost sure you would have uh, taken care to have uh, your renovations meet uh, you know, high insulation standards and, uh, and low, uh, low ventilation issues and whatnot. So probably your specific problem is best addressed through the housing policy and the retrofit of energy policy rather than the child care policy. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, we'll go to our next question from the floor. Yeah, please. Can you hear? Good. Yes. Um, my question is, is to do with small business, and obviously since this is sponsored by the Board of Trade, it's representing a, a large number of small businesses. And I think we all know that small businesses are part of the lifeblood of many communities, especially the small ones, responsible for economic growth. How or what policies does your party have specifically that will enhance the growth of small businesses and make life easier for those business owners? Thanks very much for that question. Uh, Dan, do you want to start the panel off and respond to how to help out small business? I love this question because my dad is an entrepreneur um, and he worked very hard to endure all of the paperwork and hassles the government gave him. I think anyone in here is an entrepreneur. I don't really need to go any further into that. You know how brutal it is. And uh, it's the libertarian's goal to decrease that as much as possible. Now, obviously, our, our scope of, of influence on that is smaller because we're uh, put the, as the provincial party. But we will do what we can, including removing the Ontario portion of the corporate tax. Okay. Uh, Bob, do you want to continue the discussion on how to enhance the environment for small business? Small and local businesses is truly important to uh, the Green Party. Local businesses, it's like larger businesses as, as well as small businesses. Um, one of the things that small business has been hit by recently is the uh, increase in the minimum wage from $11 and change to $14 and hopefully to up to $15 um, if uh, the government gets elected falls through with uh, that program. I think that's really important. I think that workers or any business um, or any uh, employer at all deserves to have a fair wage. But it puts small businesses at a disadvantage. So for that, uh, the Green Party proposes to uh, reduce the uh, payroll tax that small businesses pay. Uh, larger businesses that aren't as severely affected by uh, the increase in the minimum wage because most of their workers are already being paid at levels much higher than what the minimum wage was. Um, there should be a higher tax. In, in I think 1990 or so, uh, corporate business taxes were at around 26% um, federally and, and provincially combined. And that's all been reduced down to something uh, on the order of, of 11% now. That's a huge loss in revenue. That could actually be uh, regained by increasing the corporate large business taxes back up to uh, a level about halfway between, perhaps 19 uh, percent or so for the large business taxes. And that then would um, provide revenue that we would miss out on, on the payroll tax minimization for the small businesses. That's how it would help the small businesses. Thanks, Bob. Uh, could you pass the mic over to Kelly? I don't think we have to share a big work. 
Small business uh, is the heart of our community, especially out in um, the smaller communities. Uh, you generally don't have big corporations uh, settling in smaller communities. I know that there's been a, a big push in some communities to keep the likes of Walmart out uh, in, in the face of, uh, of small business. Um, small business in this, in this province, uh, or sorry, Ontario spends about $6 billion every year on goods and services in this province. Uh, so we will require a minimum uh, to come from small and medium-sized businesses uh, with a 33% to come from small business and scaling business. So what that does is it allows small business to grow uh, without having to worry about um, goods and services that we need here in the province coming from other countries or out of the province. Um, so we, uh, you know, we definitely uh, will be working with small business to make sure that entrepreneurs are uh, you know, equated with the ability to uh, have sustainable business and to grow. Um, Bob touched on the $15 minimum wage. The NDP is in favor of a $15 minimum wage. Um, it, uh, uh, that, when you give people that uh, minimum wage, it allows them to buy back into the economy, which then, again, uh, strengthens the small business communities as well. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Joe, could you pick up the discussion on enhancing the environment for small business? In Absolutely. Um, so, our government did bring in the minimum wage to fourteen dollars an hour, and we are projecting uh, when, when, when we say when we become government again, uh, we will be guaranteed to raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars from January. When we made this investment uh, into people's uh, living wage, we decided that we know it's going to take a hit on small businesses. So we have lowered the small business income taxes by one percent, and to offset the, from the eleven sixty or the number was to $14. Um, we are going to do that again uh, in the meantime because the difference between income tax, uh, free income tax for anyone at low income, and the dollar increase to $15 minimum wage is $800 in your pocket more with a dollar increase in your minimum wage. Um, that is, when it comes to income tax time, your take home would be $18 more in your pockets than if you weren't paying taxes at all. Um, we will continue to do investments into small business. Uh, and since 2003, we actually have, uh, in Kitchener side of things, invested in the small business center in Kitchener itself. But we also need to recognize that we also are investing in small businesses when it comes to the rural areas, into the agricultural side of things. We need to continue to make those investments and continue to invest so that if anything happens to crops, they have the funds from the government and the help and backing to carry on. Thanks, Joe. Mike, you want to conclude the panel's discussion on small business? Please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, as, as someone who has ran their own small business, uh, I can attest firsthand that there are many, many challenges in, in doing that and, and sustaining your business. Um, I think that there's, there's been a lot of things overlooked uh, by previous governments when it comes to small business uh, over the last sort of 10 to 15 years. And I can tell you with 100% with certainty that the Ontario PC Party is here for small business. Um, lowering your hydro rates, that was one of, uh, you know, uh, running a frozen yogurt shop. Uh, hydro rates were something that, that ate up almost, you know, half of my expenditures, you know, when we looked at what was actually going out the door. Uh, reducing small business tax rate by 8.7% uh, and freezing the minimum wage at $14 an hour um, and then of course uh, you know, making up for that by, by those people not having to pay for uh, the provincial portion of their income tax. Uh, you know, saying that it's going to be $18 uh, you know, more in your pocket, that's fine if you're able to keep your job. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people that have had to cut back hours, I've talked to a lot of people that have had to cut back benefits uh, because of the you know, the, the over 20% increase that came in in a very short period of time. Uh, so, you know, in closing to that, the PC party is here for small business. Thanks, Mike. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm just ready for this to know. <laughs> well, it helps when you turn it on. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, what's the direct that Mr. Harris and I have been defying uh, information on the you yet? Mike is the Hello. Uh, sorry, my question is mostly aimed at Mr. Harris, as I haven't been able to find uh, the information on this yet. Uh, Mr. Harris, my name is Ryan O'Hagan, I am a high school teacher. 
and iWatches daily our support staff and specifically our educational assistants struggle to help students keep themselves safe and make a decent living. Um, EAs are a pivotal part of our education system and teachers and students uh, rely on them heavily. EAs often work in dangerous working conditions and are at a substantially higher risk of injury than teachers but are often looked at as second class in the education system. How will your party aim to remedy this? Well, let's uh, ask all the parties uh, how they aim to uh, protect the position of EAs or educational assistants. Uh, Kelly, could you start the panel's discussion off on that question? Thank you, sir. Absolutely. It is our belief that the educational funding formula is outdated. It's about it's over 20 years old. Um, and the education funding formula does things like dictate how many teachers are in a classroom, um, how many early and childhood education people are in the classroom, and classroom sizes, curriculum, things like that. Currently, we're seeing in uh, the lower grades, you're seeing um, more kids in classrooms, up to from 32 to 36 young children in a class. Uh, with an ECE teacher uh, or, or ECE person in the classroom two days a week. What that does is it makes the classroom a, a, a dangerous place not only for the teachers but for the students as well. So we have a plan to um, encourage more people uh, through funding uh, in the secondary schools, uh, sorry, post-secondary education, um, to bring more people into the ECE programs and to entice them to, uh, to carry through in the program so that we can put them into the schools, create the jobs that need to be created, put the classroom sizes back down to 26, um, which is a much safer level for all the children and the teachers, and it actually allows the teachers to um, teach the curriculum. So uh, ECEs are, are, are a vital part of, of, our, uh, of our education system. Um, so that's our plan to put more ECEs and hire more teachers and uh, uh, rework the education funding program. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Dan, did you pick up the discussion on educational assistance? Sure. So, did you guys know that um, the, uh, the public education actually costs more than private education? Some of you may have considered getting private education for your children and uh, balked at how much it costs, but if you look at it on a per student basis, it's actually cheaper than public education. Uh, the Libertarian Party would allow you to take the money that the government would be spending on your child's education right now and spend it at a place of your choosing. So, like I said before, um, we want to have education choice. We want it so that every dollar that ends up in your pocket, you choose where to send it. So, although we won't be uh, trying to eliminate um, uh, education, educational uh, programs immediately, uh, we, we want to strengthen the economy so that you have the money to afford it before we do anything like that. And we would make sure, and also there's, there's federal uh, money that comes in for education, so it, we wouldn't want to lose that. So we would definitely want to make it so that uh, you receive a voucher and for a certain number of dollars, and you can spend that in a place of your choosing, uh, tutors perhaps, uh, private school. I, I know that um, a lot of my experiences with education was being dissatisfied with the school and not having any choice. You just kind of have to go to the closest one. And the Libertarian Party wants to put an end to that. Uh, thanks. Sorry, I ran out of time. I was going to address the question more directly. <laughs> thanks, Dan. Uh, Mike, Mike's closest to you. Maybe sure. Yeah, so Ryan, sorry we haven't had a chance to, to get in touch earlier, uh, but happy to answer the question for you now. Um, my wife, Kit, it was a resource teacher uh, in North Bay before we we moved down here. And, uh, you know, of course, making sure that everyone, not just teachers and EAs, have a safe work environment is, and I think we'll all agree that that, that, is, that is a big priority for all of us. Um, it's, it's, it's been our intent throughout this campaign to make sure that we, we aren't going to be losing any frontline service jobs. So whether that be, you know, doctors, whether that be nurses, whether that be teachers, um, and, and of course other, you know, educational entities, whether that be EC or ECEs or EAs. Uh, it's, it's not something that, that we're looking to cut, absolutely. You know, I know uh, our, our leader has said that in the last debate we will not be making any public sector cuts. It's not something that we want to be doing. Um, and, and we want to make sure, of course, that, like you said, everybody needs to be working in a safe environment. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Bob, can you pick up the discussion? I have the privilege of speaking at the Development Services panel discussion, where this came up as well, the 
ecosystems are at danger from sometimes very old clients who don't have a control. Uh, a few alcohol syndrome uh, children, for example, have the ability to be extremely violent. So the educational system isn't addressing those needs. We have two educational systems in, in Ontario, uh, possibly four, if you include the French language. Uh, one of the educational systems does the integration. It um, lets the children all be in the same classroom together, possibly with educational assistant help. And sometimes this becomes an environment where the kids aren't able to, um, to deal with the environment that they're in, all the hubbub and noise of, of the rest of the classroom, which is actually education of you know, large classroom size. The other board of education, the uh, Catholic board of education, um, oh, sorry, it's, that was the Catholic board of education that does the screening. It's the uh, public board of education that was supposed to have individual um, um, special education classes for developmentally challenged uh, children. But unfortunately, the funding wasn't there. So in practice, they ended up being screening uh, environments as well. So more funding for developmental services is necessary, which would directly address the needs of the educational assistance in the school system. Thanks, Bob. And Joe, could you wrap up the panel's discussion on educational assistance? Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan, for the question. Um, we've pledged in our, our budget another $300 million uh, for, to improve spec education itself. Um, it may not be enough, but it's definitely a start. One of the things that we also need to look at is, is that Bob touched on this, is the developmental uh, side of things. Uh, we have uh, different classifications for all kinds of different, uh, there's autism, there's uh, whatever else on, on, that, on that list. We need to look at a universal side of things. And that's one of the things that I want to bring to my party is looking at funding one developmental uh, strain and one developmental tree that there's one place you go to. So there's not multiple different companies trying to get funding for one area that there is when they're all overlapping on the services that they provide. That's one thing that I want to bring into the government. Thanks, Joe. We'll take the next question from the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Don't forget to turn the mic on. Is it on? It is on. I turned it off. I'll make some of it. Is it on? Yeah. Why don't we leave it on? I watched the previous person. Didn't turn it off. Go figure. <laughs> and you've already blown in the first 15 seconds. Bring that bell, bring it. I'm joking. We'll do a reset for you, okay? Thank you very much. Give it a go. My name Thanks. is Terry Burr, and I'm a beekeeper. Myself and many other beekeepers in Ontario just hit devastating losses this year. The long numbers aren't in, but it's going to be close to 70%. That's 7-0. That is disastrous. Einstein once said, when bees die, eight years later, humankind will die. The European Union, just in the last month, had banned totally the use of neonics or neonicotinoids in their, <coughs> in their crops. So I'd like to hear what you plan to do to solve this worldwide problem, but to start in Ontario by doing something. I know the little party started, but it got bent. Okay. It got stopped. Well, we're talking about bees, panel bees. And believe me, it's not an insignificant issue out here. Uh, Bob, you want to start us off on that? Thank you for your questions. I, I'd be curious to think, you're an agriculturist or a, a farmer, a, a beekeeper, or, or is this um, more of a hobby than an in, industry? In I've had 40 hives, I now have 12. 40 is much more than a hobbyist. Yes, okay, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Obviously, the Green Party is in favor of sustainability, sustainable agriculture, sustainable ecology. Um, and in my understanding of it, most farmers, all farmers, are after sustainability as well. Uh, a farm cannot produce any crops at all without pollinators, without, without bees. And I, I'm probably uh, correctly thinking that you rent out your bees to the various farms to act as pollinators for the various crops that are out there. Farmers cannot survive um, in their farms unless they have pollinators available. So it's, it's incumbent on the farmers themselves to understand that this is an issue and stop using those neonicotinoids. It could be achieved by legislation. Um, and I think that's probably one of the, the correct ways to go, as, as the other jurisdictions have done as well. Um, 
But farmers themselves, I believe, are, are sustainable agriculturalists. And when the understanding comes to them that um, this is jeopardizing their own livelihood, uh, they will see the need to stop the use of neonicotinoids, hopefully without the pressure of legislation. But legislation, if, be, if there needs to be. Great, thanks, Bob. Uh, Mike, you want to continue the panel's discussion on the questioner's concern about bees? Yeah, absolutely. So, thank you, Terry. Appreciate the question. Um, I was up in Wellesley uh, last Friday night uh, for their uh, fish fry, and Mark Cullen, uh, I don't know if you were there or not, uh, but he, he was giving a great talk on, on pollinators and, and how they are you know, going by the wayside and we're not seeing, seeing bees and, and other pollinators around as, as nearly as much as we used to. Um, I think as far as you know, banning banning specific pesticides or um, you know certain certain ways of treating crops, uh, it's something that that our government would be open to exploring, uh, consulting with professionals in the industry, uh, and I think that's the best way for us to proceed forward with that. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Joe, if you'd like to continue the discussion. Absolutely. So, as Terry mentioned, we have started the process and started the conversation on the neonicotinoids, and I know uh, I was at the same uh, market and heard the same story about the pollinators. It is definitely, uh, it, to my eyes, from what I've been hearing, is a crisis, and I think it is something that we need to take seriously. And as, as an MPP for this writing, absolutely I'll be taking that back to the government. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Kelly, could you continue the panel's discussion on the bee issue? Um, I think we all understand the importance of bees. Um, without bees, we don't have pollination. Without pollination, we don't have fruits and vegetables. We don't have crops. We don't have plants. Um, and eventually, I mean, animals eat plants. We eat animals uh, for the most part, and we eat plants. So, you know, bees are very important to, to the ecological system um, in the entirety of humanity, really. Uh, so climate change is uh, a big part of that as well. So. Um, and I think that really has a lot to do with uh, a lot of the pesticides and things that we've been using. I know when I was younger, we drive through um, the farmers, uh, like roads where the farmers were, and you could smell the pesticides, you could see them with the big tanks um, on, the, on the trucks, you know, going through the fields and doing all of these things. Um, we're now starting to understand that it's not only the bee population that's being um, affected by this, but it's, it's uh, other insects as well, like butterflies and things like that. Um, all of these insects are, are here for a reason. They do, you know, different things. So, uh, as the NPP government, we are on track for um, climate change and things like this, and agriculture, protecting our agriculture and our farmland. We have the most fruitful farmland uh, in, in all of the country, in Ontario. Uh, we need to protect that, and if that means, you know, uh, sitting down with stakeholders and uh, talking about um, pesticides and things like that, uh, that's exactly what we plan to do. Thanks, Kelly. And Dan, could you complete the panel's discussion on this question, please? So I was actually under the impression that uh, what was killing the bees was a mystery. Uh, I hadn't heard this particular uh, pesticide. Uh, I'd actually be happy to be educated on that, uh, that matter. Uh, I'd like to say that the uh, libertarian policy is that of justice. If someone has sprayed pesticide and that pesticide has caused you to lose your bees, uh, then you have a right not just to have these pesticides banned, but to be made whole, to have the, the perpetrators of, of damaging your property um, made to pay uh, reparations for uh, what's happened to you. We believe strongly in property rights. So if you pollute, um, then you're damaging someone else's land, you're damaging their health, and you must be held to account for that. Uh, so I think that my answer would be similar to the PC party uh, representative here, is that um, we probably want to consult the experts. Uh, we would want to find out uh, whether or not it is certain that uh, this sort of thing has caused the problem. And we may want to even strengthen the judiciary so that you uh, may be able to get the this yourself against um, you know, perhaps uh, neighboring farms that have poisoned your land, if that is indeed what happened. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, folks, we're going to take just three more questions, so I'll recognize the two gentlemen on the floor, and I have uh, one further question coming in on email that I want to post to the panel, unless you guys come up with it first. Sir, your question, please. Uh, 
my name is Marcel Deschan, and I'm an undecided voter with a business background. So my question is to the three major parties that are buying this election. It seems to me, if I read and understand your political platforms, the Liberal and the NDP are fighting each other to see who can spend the most money to buy our votes. On the other hand, the PC party, and in particular Mr. Ford, your leader, seems to have absolutely no idea what he's talking about. He talks about efficiency. Sir, sir, okay, sir, the question is? The question is coming, sir. The question's coming right now, sir. It We're is. We're here to listen to them, not you, sir. With all due the PC respect. party is talking about efficiencies, but seems to have no idea, is unwilling to share with us. Our representative to manage the fiscal responsibility in the province of Ontario. to all members of the panel. You talk about the duty to be fiscally responsible in your election platforms. Uh, Joe, could you start us off on that discussion, please? Absolutely, and thanks for the question. And that's one thing that uh, I've been hearing when I'm knocking on the doors, is the amount of debt and the amount that we're spending. Um, one thing that I want personally is with my finance background is to make sure we get that under control. We do not need to cut our social services, that is an absolute core value of mine, but we need to be financially responsible. Uh, our government is going to be looking at any unspent uh, projected funds to anything that we have. If there's any money left over after that project is done, it'll go right to the debt. The other side of it is we need to look at how we are bringing new projects in. Um, doing a million dollar study over here and it fails. Doing a million dollar study over here and it fails. You're going to hear that in the past that the Liberal government has misspent and this, that, and the other. I can't speak for the past government, but what I can speak for is now. Where I am coming from is I, am, I believe we need to be fiscally responsible. We need to look at other opportunities where we can uh, bring something from another country, another province. Somebody else is doing something right that we want to do. We need to look at those things and bring them here. Why are we recreating the wheel? when we know there's another area in this world that is doing it better than we are, or doing it and we are not, we need to look at that so we don't re recreate the wheel and start spending more money. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Dan, at the far end of the table, could you continue the panel's discussion on fiscal responsibility of your party's platform? Thank you. Uh, so I've said before that we're not interested in cutting programs. Um, that will leave Ontarians in the lurch. Uh, we want to make sure that you keep your the things that you rely on. But we don't feel the same way about corporate welfare. Uh, the first thing that we will do is completely eliminate the billions of dollars of direct corporate subsidies uh, that are received by businesses. There's no excuse for this. This is just money flowing directly from your pocket into the pocket of corporations, and it needs to end. Uh, we would also not have any subsidies for individuals, no more art projects, no more film students, uh, we would eliminate subsidies to municipalities. No longer will the uh, Kitchener-Conestoga area be forced to pay, like I said before, for Toronto's infrastructure projects. If you live in Toronto, that's where you should be when you pay for uh, that. Those are who, the ones who should be paying for the infrastructure projects that they're going to use. Uh, we would eliminate subsidies for charitable organizations. The Trillion Foundation alone costs us $136 million annually. Uh, people should be free to choose the charities that are worthy of their money. They shouldn't have some bureaucrat deciding for them where the, the money should go. Oh God, I have so many more things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll leave it there. Well, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, Bob, could you continue the panel's discussion on fiscal responsibility, please? I, I hope that the Green Party will, will never be accused of, of buying votes. The purpose of, of government is to look after the well-being of the citizens, and sometimes that costs money. It's not the purpose of government to provide gifts at election time. But I think I would like to rebut Mr. Benoit directly, if you would permit me to do that. Um, I, one of the organizations that I'm working with is the Alliance Against Poverty, a group of people that, uh, both uh, well-off people and people who live a life of poverty, who work together to equalize funds, so to speak. Um, I asked, then direct, 
just before the uh, museum's culture exchange. But I had to give a speech on providing cultural funding. And everyone at the Alliance Against Poverty, poor people, people living in the life of poverty, and the rich people alike, all told me it is an absolutely crucial thing for the government to do. It provides relief, it provides the reason for being. So I believe that fiscally responsible spending is absolutely important, and one of those fiscally responsible ways of spending is to provide arts and culture funding for those people who need the most. Thanks, Bob. Mike, could you continue the panel's discussion on the fiscal responsibility of your party's platform? Yeah, of course. So you know, one of the hallmarks of the PC party is fiscal responsibility. Um, and making sure that, that we are being transparent and accountable to taxpayers and, and respecting their money. Um, I think that um, you know, we, we're, we're talking about you know, where we're going to find these efficiencies and where they're going to come from, um, but there's, there's a long list of, of you know, uh, misspent liberal dollars uh, that will make up some of that. And we are going to be having a line-by-line -line, line audit of, of the Ontario books, if you will, uh, and, and it's not going to be an issue for us to be able to find um, to be able to find efficiencies or, or money that's buried in there. We're seeing almost you know on a weekly basis that the Auditor General is coming out with some new accounting or some accounting regularity of, of of what's going on here in the province. And you know we've 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 had a couple of good examples of, of ways that we can find this uh, that that are under Doug uh, that I understand you're not happy with, but he has come out with a couple of examples of, of how we're able to do this and. Like I said, you know, making sure that, that, that businesses are able to create jobs, making sure that those people are then able to stimulate the economy, it all goes hand in hand in that fiscal responsibility as well. Thanks, Mike. And Kelly, did you conclude the panel's discussion on the fiscal responsibility of the NDP platform? Um, our platform is the only one that actually is completely costed out. We are the only party that has put a platform together and presented it um, to the public, you can take a look at it, it's online, it's completely costed, as I said. It'll show you exactly where the money's going to come from and exactly where the money's going to go. It'll tell you where we're funding and um, the advantages and the things that we're going to be doing to push this economy forward. Um, and again, I will reiterate, like I said before, we will be asking the largest corporations, I should say the most profitable corporations, uh, and uh, the richest Ontarians to pay a little bit more to make, these things, to make these things happen. Uh, the debt that we have incurred has not happened overnight. This is not something that has happened in the last four years. This is something that has been an ongoing issue between the Liberals and the Conservative governments. Um, I, I, it, it's going to be a long process. It's not something that's going to happen in the next four years. Yes, Andrea Horvath has said we will be running a deficit for, until 2023. She is not afraid of a deficit. She actually has the lowest projected deficit of all of the parties. Um, I know Bob is going to. <laughs> yeah, we've had this discussion already. Um, so, as far as fiscal responsibility is concerned, it is the government's responsibility to be fiscally responsible with your money. Uh, and if they're not, it's your right to mark an X on that box on June the seventh to make that change. Thanks, Kelly. Um, this will be the last question uh, we can take from the floor because of time constraints, so I apologize to the lady and the gentleman behind uh, this gentleman. Uh, sir, you have the floor. Yes, I'm uh, Mike Marshman, and uh, currently there's an environmental assessment being undertaken between, into high-speed rail between uh, Kitchener and London, and uh, the uh, scope of this uh, particular environmental assessment has been restricted by the Liberal Parliament to investigate uh, speed rail only. Will your parties expand this EA to look at all the options to high speed rail? Thanks very much. Uh, found the front page of the New Hamburg Independent today as well, the issue of high speed rail in our uh, in our uh, riding. Mike, could you start the panel's discussion on high speed rail and environmental impact? Yeah, sure. Uh, Mike, great name, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, we, we've been very clear on, on where we stand with high-speed rail. Uh, we will commit to continuing with the environmental assessment uh, that is in place. But during that roughly two-year period that that will, uh, that will, that will go on, uh, we want to make sure that we are talking to people who live in the area. We want to make sure that we're talking to farmers. We want to make sure that we're talking to business owners. 
and making sure that all of their voices are heard and that that gets, um, you know, that gets accounted for uh, when we look at how, how this could possibly roll out. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Joe, could you continue the conversation on high-speed rail? Absolutely. This has been uh, in my radar since I put my name in as a candidate for this. Um, I've been to the town halls. I was actually at the one here in uh, New Hamburg. And uh, I know what the concerns are. I know that the uh, concerns are the route that is supposedly proposed. I'll get into that a little later. Um, but I know what the concerns are. I actually went on a three-hour bus tour to, to talk to the farmers, to talk to the emergency services, to see firsthand what the issues will be, what the impact of a high-speed rail system will be. I have brought that back to my party, brought that back to the government, and I advocated uh, because they had no idea that these concerns were, were in, uh, coming forward. So they are now aware of them. They know because I have brought that to them, and that's exactly what I'm going to continue to do. The EA process has started. Uh, there is no proposed route. The route that everybody has seen was a ruler drawn on a map for cost analysis only. There is no set route. The next step is for the EA to come up with their terms of reference. After they come up with the terms of reference, they will move into the community consultation. We will be coming out to the communities. We will be talking, as we have been, uh, with the community, find out what the issues are, find out what the concerns are, and take that back to build the plan for the high-speed rail. Thanks, Joel. Uh, Dan, could you continue the panel's discussion on high-speed rail? Thanks. Um, well, the libertarian policy is to keep government involved as small as possible. Uh, obviously, there's going to be infrastructure projects. Uh, we would be very skeptical of the need for grandiose infrastructure projects. Like we might remember under uh, Premier Mark Harris, uh, the 407 in Gondo, where during his so-called common sense revolution, we ended up with a highway that uh, was leased out for 99 years for 3.1 billion, but the province invested up to 104 billion in creative. Um, we are, of course, skeptical about big infrastructure projects, but it doesn't mean that we're uh, completely opposed to them. Obviously, someone needs to build the road. Uh, so we would approach it with a careful hand and a eye to eliminate bureaucracy, um, like complicated meetings, to ensure that there is private involvement as much as possible. If the whole endeavor could be uh, privately done, the better. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Kelly, could you continue the panel's discussion on high-speed rail? High-speed rail is a top, is a, is a hot button um, out in the communities, out in the, in the rural areas. And rightfully so. Um, a lot of farmers and a lot of stakeholders believe that, like, that the high-speed rail initiative is already a go. Um, and it's not. As, as, um, as Joe said, it's a, a line that's been drawn on a map. Um, it's definitely not going through without consultations, and I think we, pretty much most of us will agree on the same issue. Um, we need to have consultations, we need to have meetings with stakeholders, municipalities, um, those that are affected in the community, uh, farmers who could, quite conceivably could be losing land. Um, farmers are concerned about what high-speed rail is going to look like on their land, um, you know, to save water resources, to, you know, what effect is this going to have on their livestock, what effect is this going to have on noise. Uh, so these are things that need to be looked at, um, you know, as, as well as the environmental assessment. Um, we want to broaden the environmental assessment to include other corridor options because we know that building uh, fast rail will only, will only be successful in the communities if everyone understands the benefits. If you don't understand the benefits of it, um, it you, we all need to understand what the benefits are. Uh, transportation keeps our communities growing. We need to move people back and forth from one community to the other. Uh, so we believe high-speed rail definitely needs to be in the forefront and all stakeholders need to be involved in this conversation. Thanks, Kelly. And Bob, the final word on this uh, part of our debate and the question and answer period is yours on high-speed rail. This gets to be the most important issue in, in kitchen Costco. If there are work that the Liberal government has already put out, is only a line drawn on that for costing purposes. 
how can we possibly change the route and still apply the same cost formula to a, a different route? It's not possible. For the um, environmental assessment now, if they decide to change the route later, how can that environmental assess assessment still apply to a changed route? Um, I was a big fan of high speed rail. In fact, in my platform document here, it says the Green Party is in favor of high speed rail. But having listened to the concerns of, of Peter Conestoga citizens at the very same town hall that Mr. Bowen was at, I've changed my mind. There is an alternative uh, available called high performance rail. It's a term of art that I hadn't heard until uh, the town hall meeting, which uses reasonably high speed uh, trains up to about 180 kilometers an hour on the existing railway corridor, which would not affect. Um, farmers at all in, in cutting their lands in half or, or providing an insufficient number of overpass routes. Um, it's still going to cost money. It's still going to require a new rail bit. It's still going to require an overhead uh, capillary wires for electrification. I'm green, I want electrification on those things. Um, but high speed rail for me is no longer a viable option for uh, anything west of Kitchener. So as a Green Party member, I pledge to you to um, go against my party's policy and advocate for you for a high performance rail on the existing border and not to create a new swath through the middle of our land. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that concludes the question and answer period of uh, our all candidates meeting this evening. We've talked about downtown beautification, leadership skills, childcare, small business, safety for educational assistance, the bee industry, fiscal responsibility and high speed rail. And there were other people that had other questions to ask to that we didn't get to. Uh, great work, panel. Thank you very much for giving to us a little snippet, anyhow, of yours and your party's platforms on this. It's now time for closing statements. Uh, they are to be uh, no more than two minutes in length. And Mike, if you could start your closing statements, please. minutes last two seconds. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Make sure the mic's not for good. Uh, so once again, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad that, that there was such a great turnout and, and we were able to field so many questions. Of course, uh, again, thanks to Buddy Pumphouse for having us. Uh, thanks to the other candidates here uh, with me tonight. And of course, thanks to uh, the Board of Trade for organizing this. Um, the Ontario PC Party is the only party that will bring real change to Ontario. Uh, from the beginning of our campaign, our party has put forward clear policies to put Ontario back on the path to a better future. We will clean up the hydro mess, starting with Hydro One, reducing your hydro bills by another 12%. We will bring jobs back to Ontario by lowering taxes for individuals and business businesses that will drive economy in the Waterloo region. We will also support families by improving health care, providing parents with choice and up to a 75% rebate for childcare. We will consult with parents to review and refocus the elementary and secondary school curriculums uh, to focus on the essentials, reading, writing, and math. We will also help to make housing more affordable by increasing supply and maintaining rent control, which we actually introduced, which uh, a lot of people may not know. Uh, so before concluding, uh, I wanted to directly address some of the things that are being said in ads uh, and that are being run on the radio. Uh, in the office, I've received a number of calls about how we are going to cut $6 billion in frontline services. Uh, this is not true. It's not our intent to do that. Uh, but what we will cut is waste and mismanagement. So, you know, I've got some samples here. Uh, $8 billion uh, on e-health. Uh, $1.1 billion on uh, gas plants that never got built. $2 billion on smart meters. $6 million for our favorite guy, the, uh, the CEO of, of Hydro One, the $6 million man. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, <laughs> we're also being told that we're going to privatize healthcare. Again, that is an outright lie, not something we're going to do. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. I know we've only got a few seconds left. Uh, so thank you very much again for, for coming out tonight. And of course, thank you to the other candidates here at the table. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Joe, could you uh, favor us with your closing statement, please? Absolutely. So I would like to also thank the New Hampshire Board of Trade, uh, the Putting House. Everybody else uh, that's in this room that's come out and the people that came forward and asked those questions and my fellow candidates here. <clears throat> uh, just to talk on um, some of the things here, one thing that was in here, we do have a fully costed platform as well. It has been released. Uh, it is a clear plan that the Liberal government will continue to grow Ontario. You can find it on our website. 
you don't have to click on anything and input your information as in some parties up here. You just click on it and there it is. Um, this riding is the most important riding in this region. Um, it hasn't been treated that way, but I know that this is the most important region, or excuse me, riding in this region. Um, we have three rural areas and one piece of the city. That is huge, and, and, and right by me, literally huge. Um, <laughs> we know that this is important. And I am going to make sure that Queen's Park knows that this riding should be the one that they look at when they come to this area. This is the one that I'm going to advocate for. This is the area, this is the riding that is driving this region. We need to find a balance between the rural areas and the urban areas. That is definitely one of the things that I'm going to find uh, when I'm talking out with the mayors of the townships, the mayor of the city. I'm, I'm talking and finding out what are the issues, what are the concerns, and you have to find that balance. Um, the other finding of the balance is when it comes to fiscal responsibility. With my finance background, I know that I'm going to make sure that the party has a platform, we have a plan to get back in the black, and they're going to stick to it. I have a strong voice. I have been already advocating for this community when it comes to high speed rail and other issues. I will continue to do so going forward. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Bob, your closing comments, please. Green Party, of course, has a fully cost of platform as well. Um, so I urge to look at the platform. But I'd like to wear my, my Democratic reform hat for a moment. We've got five candidates up there. There are six candidates in the future of Congress. We've got Dr. Dan Holt's not here tonight. Dr. Dan Holt's not here tonight. But do look at the Consensus Ontario website as well to find out what he's offering. You can only vote for one of us. And although all of us have the best interests at, at heart for Kitchen Honest Over for Ontario, for you, the citizens, we're all going to go about it in different ways. Don't vote out of fear. Don't vote for something that you don't like to keep on something you like even less. If you vote for something you don't like, you vote to get something you don't like. Find out which of the candidates best aligns with your view. Find out which of the candidates actually matches your um, ethical values, uh, your, your desires, your needs, what you need to get out of a potential uh, candidate. And then vote for what you believe. Vote for the candidate who best represents you. Strategic voting is, is not something that's going to get you uh, a government that you want. Simply going to pick one party against another. What you really need is, is a, a, a way of, of working together. Proportional representation will achieve that. So perhaps that's uh, the sort of candidate you want to vote for. But don't vote out of fear. Vote for something that will actually get you what you need, what you want. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, Dan, your closing comment, please. So uh, the candidates to my left today uh, have their campaigns subsidized by the government. So if there's one thing I want to get uh, done uh, spinning out before the time runs, it's that if you like the message that the Libertarians are making, uh, but you're afraid to vote for us for the reasons that Bob was mentioning, that uh, you're worried about wasting your vote or something like that, uh, know that if we get uh, more than, I think it's 2% of the vote, then we too will benefit from these subsidies and we'll be a much stronger presence in the next election. You may think that um, the Libertarian Party is, is just a more conservative PC party, and uh, that's not true. Um, we're actually very socially <coughs> um, We fully support the cannabis store and things like that. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's our <coughs> core value to be, as, to be as uninvolved in people's personal lives as possible. Um, another thing as well uh, is I'd like to uh, I'd like your help uh, demanding that uh, the libertarians be included in um, debates and all candidates be in, in the future. Uh, there were a few this year that I uh, was excluded from, um, and it doesn't seem reasonable to me for the reasons that Bob was explaining. We all have uh, different views and we all can represent you in different ways, and you should be free to hear uh, the opinions of all the candidates and to choose the one that represents you the best. So I, I like to think that uh, many of you have discovered that libertarians represent you the best. And I hope that um, you won't be 
worry about tossing your vote away or anything like that because you know that next election we will come back stronger than ever before with that additional funding, with the additional prestige that comes from getting the great vote. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. And uh, Kelly, the last word on closing statements belongs to you. Thank you. Uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight and for having us here to have these um, great questions brought to us, um, have some conversation. And I'd like to thank each one of our um, candidates up here. It takes a lot to keep your name on a ballot. Uh, it's not something that any of us take lightly. Um, it is something that we're all passionate about, and I hope that that has shone through today. As I said before, this is a change election in this province. We have an opportunity to make some big changes here. Uh, change for the better with Andrea Horvath. Uh, we have uh, the ability and the plan to eliminate crushing student debt. Students are graduating from school with debts that are taking them 15 years to pay off. That should never be a thing. You should never have to pay 15 years for a student debt. We need to end, and we will end, hallway medicine and long wait times in emergency rooms. We will expand uh, in a reasonable way our transit systems in the region, as I said before. We will provide $12 a day childcare, which will allow people to return to work after having children, and it will allot them the opportunity to have more children in the future if they so wish to do. We will buy back Hydro One, uh, because it never should have been sold in the first place. Uh, we'll buy it back and your hydro rates will go down by 30%. We will implement the Ontario Water Strategy to stop putting water bottle company interests ahead of people, towns, and farms. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody knows what's going on. I'm sure we all do in Guelph and Aberfoyle. Uh, we have a company there that has been pulling water out of the reservoir without a permit. Uh, so, you know, that needs to stop as well. With the government, an NDP government, you will get a fully costed plan, you will get real results, you will have a responsible government, uh, you will have truth. Um, Andrea is very honest in what she's doing. Uh, I am here to represent her and the NDP, and I hope that I can count on your vote on June the 7th. Please remember, go out and vote.